and I'm pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Lori Santos, who's going to share with us her thoughts on the question of do animals feel and think like us? Lori Santos is an associate professor of psychology at Yale University and director of Yale University's Comparative Cognition Laboratory. She received both her BA and PhD from Harvard University and her research explores the evolutionary origins of human cognition by studying the cognitive capacities present in non-human primates. Lori has won numerous awards for her scientific achievements and for her teaching and mentorship, including the Yale University Arthur Greer Memorial Prize for Outstanding Junior Faculty and the Stanton Prize from the Society for, for Philosophy and Psychology. She was recently voted one of Popular Science Magazine's Brilliant 10 Young Minds. So I now turn to a very special Experts in Emotion interview with a treasured local colleague of mine, Dr. Lori Santos. So welcome, Lori. Thanks for speaking today. Thanks for having me. So I thought what I might do is just start off a little bit by asking you what first got you interested in this topic of emotion and how it can apply to non-humans. Yeah, so I actually got interested in non-human animals by actually hanging out with them. Um, as, a, as a college student, I had the opportunity to actually do some research with monkeys. And that actually brought me down to a very nice, warm Caribbean island where I got to hang out with a bunch of monkeys for the first time. And I think I can remember the moment when I first got interested, not just in their cognition, but particularly in their emotion, when I was hanging out on a beach that I was finding really beautiful and it was warm and there was a breeze. And I noticed there was a monkey sitting right beside me who was like looking out into the water and seemed to be experiencing exactly the same things I was. And it just caused me to think like, what, what does he know about the world? What does he know about the scene? Is he enjoying it? Does he find this beautiful? Um, and it was kind of a fascinating moment because I realized that you know, we now have these cool tools in cognitive science where we can answer some of these, these big questions. And so that was kind of what got me into it. Um, That's a nice but I bet story. anybody who's had an animal, whether it's, I was going to say whether you have a pet dog or a cat or even a goldfish, right, you can't help but wonder what they're experiencing and if they experience some of the same things that you do. Excellent. So I want to ask you just a little more about some of the work you've done in this area. So, I mean, you've really conducted the you know, seminal work here looking at the evolutionary origins of the human mind through the study of non-human primates, such as you know, monkeys. And here you found that you know, monkeys seem to be able to understand what other people are thinking. And I wonder what implications you think this might have for how monkeys might understand the emotions of other people as one type of cognitive process. Yeah, well, it's still a bit of a puzzle. I mean, if you think about how we process each other's emotions or how we empathize with others, it seems to have different components, right? So I can empathize with somebody when they, say, stub their toe, and that really just involves me you know, thinking about what it would feel like to experience something like that. Um, if I think about what it would feel like for somebody to win the lottery or to find out you know, that their parent had died or something sad, those things require much richer cognitive components. They really require me to understand something about the other person's belief, their intentions, what they know. And that's what researchers in primate cognition have really been focused on, this question of whether or not other animals can actually think about what other individuals see and know. Uh, the answer so far, at least in the monkey species we work with, seems to be Yes, non-human animals can think about what others see and know. Mm -hmm. However, they fall short of thinking about what others believe. Mm -hmm. And this means there's, there's sort of a big disconnect between how we think about the minds of others and how other primates do that. Um, we don't yet know whether this translates into how others think about, how primates think about the emotions of others and how it translates into empathizing. But I think these are some big questions in the field right now. So it sounds like, although it's an open question, they may be able to be empathic, but it may be a different kind of empathy than human species experience, perhaps. Yeah, or it might be, it might be that they have some aspects of empathy, but, but not others. And I think some of the work we're doing now seems to be suggesting that they might have a lot of emotional empathy, um, mm -hmm. but maybe not as much cognitive empathy. So, so one example of this mm -hmm. is uh, a set of work trying to look at whether or not other primates actually contagiously yawn. Um, so as you, you've probably heard about in this series, mm -hmm. the fact that we yawn when other individuals yawn is really just another mechanism showing that we're kind of engaging with what others are feeling, and it's just kind of an automatic response to that. Mm -hmm. um, turns out chimpanzees and other primates also will contagiously yawn if they see other individuals mm -hmm. yawning, um, suggesting that they have some emotional ability to experience what others are experiencing. The question is just kind of how far does that go, um, and can we come up with great ways to test it? 
Well, it sounds like a lot of the work you're doing right now is going to be answering some of these important questions in the upcoming years. Well, we're trying. <laughs> <laughs> Another question I wanted to ask you a bit about is, I mean, you've also taken, you know, a comparative approach to investigating the origins of pro-social behavior in monkeys, which is really, really cool. And your work here suggests that monkeys are sometimes, but not always, willing to donate even their own food to others, right? Mm -hmm. So could you say just a bit more about these findings? Yeah, so this, yeah. this set of work is really trying to tap into whether other species have this motivation that we do to kind of help others. Um, you just, all things being equal, you want to see others, you know, feel good or get more food or have more welfare. Um, and so there's a big set of work now in the field of primate cognition trying to see whether other primates do this too. And the simple task that we tend to use is one that works something like this. You bring a primate subject in a lab and he can pull one of two different tools to get access to food. The first tool can actually give food to another guy, his friend who's in another enclosure, whereas the second tool delivers the second guy nothing. So the question is, what do primates do? Do they want to be nice to the other guy? Do they pull the first tool? Or are they kind of mean to the other guy pulling the second tool? Um, what we find in our own species that we test here at Yale, capuchin monkeys, is that these capuchin monkeys are actually nice. So if you give them this choice, more often than not, they'll pull the tool that gives the other guy food. The problem comes when you start messing around with the setup a little bit. So now imagine the same sort of situation, except the second monkey can't actually see the first monkey delivering the food. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, the first monkey is behaving anonymously. Mm -hmm. For people, probably even if you're anonymous, you'd want the other guy to get something nice. Mm -hmm. What you see in capuchins is actually just the opposite. In fact, when the capuchins are anonymous, they actually are more likely to pull the mean tool, the tool that gives the other guy nothing. And so this is just one result, but it suggests that the way that other species actually process, whether they're willing to give food to others or willing to be altruistic, might be quite different than what we do in our own species. And it's still really early in this work, but it suggests that there might be some big differences in our ability to, to empathize with other individuals' rewards. So interesting. It makes me wonder, you know, what does this say potentially about the nature of emotions that monkeys might actually feel towards others? Mm -hmm. And I think we know very little about it. And one of the, the challenges of work with other animals is that we can measure their behavior, right? We can measure which tool they pull, say. Yeah. Um, but it's actually really tricky for us to measure what they're experiencing. You know, do they feel bad when they kind of don't give the other guy some food? You know, do they get happy when he gets the food? Um, these are measures that are really tricky for us to actually objectify and, and, and actually study in meaningful ways. So it sounds like these are some of the additional challenges and exciting questions, right, that lie ahead in this field. Yeah, and I think this is where there's a nice marriage between work in affective processing in humans and in animals. You know, the hope is that we can bring some of those methods, you know, the same methods that you use in your own lab to work with animals to try to answer some of these big issues. Right. I mean, and that's just leveraging insights from one field to another. We can learn so much in this field of aff affective science that is so interdisciplinary, as you were alluding to. Exactly. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a little bit about your recent work, which you know, transcends to a different domain of the animal kingdom, where you've looked at some of our closest companions, dogs, and how they might think and feel. And I know a lot of people have their own lay beliefs about what their dog can and can't feel and the extent to which their dog truly empathizes with how they're feeling. And I wonder what you think in this domain um, and your work, sort of what have been the core discoveries here, you know, about the emotional and sort of cognitive inner lives of dogs, some of our most, you know, intimate, you know, animal friends, we'd say. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think if I had to pick the, the three coolest things we have figured out um, recently in dog cognition yeah. work, um, I guess the first would be just how good dogs are at reading our own behavioral cues. Um, one of the puzzles in primate cognition for a long time is that even really closely related primates like chimpanzees were just really bad at reading human cues. Mm -hmm. um, so you set up a simple task where a human would point to a cup that had food and you'd expect a chimpanzee subject to actually pick up on this, but chimpanzees would just ignore the pointing. They just didn't seem to understand mm -hmm. what these cues meant. Um, and what we're learning is that dogs seem naturally adapted to use the cues that humans provide. So Unlike chimpanzees, in the first trial, dogs will pick up on pointing, they use human gaze, they seem to be really well attuned to our cues, and they seem to use them in socially meaningful ways. So that was sort of surprise number one, is that dogs are even better than primates when it comes to using these cues. Um, if I had to pick kind of number two surprising result <laughs> in the cognition world, um, I think that would be how good dogs are at understanding human language. Um, I mean, we, anybody who has a dog knows that you can teach dogs to you know, sit and fetch and so on, 
But it turns out that dogs are actually better at understanding some of our words than we even thought. And this is the lovely work of Julianne Kaminsky and her colleagues, um, particularly looking at some border collie species where there are certain individuals who seem to understand lots of human words. So hmm. if you give them information about pick this specific toy or pick a toy with a new name like a blanket, um, they can understand these cues specifically as referring to particular objects. Um, and one of the dogs that uh, Kaminsky and colleagues study actually is thought to understand over a thousand different words. So wow. it seems like dogs are much better at understanding not just our social cues, but also some of our vocal cues than we thought. Um, I think the, the third spot where we're learning more about dogs um, is actually in the emotional domain, which might be the one that's most relevant uh, to the series that you're doing. Um, and that's that we're learning that just like primates, at least when it comes to reading physical emotions and emotional contagion, um, dogs seem to be uh, even more empathic than we originally thought. Um, so a recent study suggests that dogs are actually also good at contagious yawning. Um, some 70% of dogs tested uh, will contagiously yawn if they see another yawning. Um, and, so, and so that suggests that just like primates, even though their physical features are weird, they might be kind of weirder than ours or just different than ours, they might, dogs might actually be really in tune to their uh, owner's emotions and their owner's processing. Um, it's still sort of early stages in that work, but it's exciting because, it, again, we're sort of developing some new methods to get at some of this stuff. I mean, so those are three really, really cool insights that you provided. And it makes me wonder sort of what do we think at this point are some of the biggest puzzles still out there? Yeah, well, there's lots of yeah. puzzles. We'll yeah. for a long time, but, I mean, I think the one that yeah. uh, my students and I are most interested in is this puzzle about how dogs are using our social cues. Um, do they learn in some of the same social ways that humans do? Um, one of the cool things we're finding in developmental psychology right now is all the ways that children's learning can actually be constrained by what other teachers actually tell them. And we know very little about teaching in other animals, but in some ways dogs provide a perfect window into this because they're good at using our cues. There's just this big question about how do they use them? You know, can they use them to learn about artifacts or to learn how to categorize? Um, or is it just they, they attend to these cues but don't learn in some of the same ways as humans? And so the biggest puzzle and the kind of most exciting thing uh, we're doing in our dog cognition lab now is to act actually look at dog pedagogy to see do mm -hmm. dogs pick up on the same pedagogical cues as humans do. Very cool stuff you have going on in your lab, Dr. Santos. <laughs> so I wanted to ask you then, as you think about the future of this field, where do you see it headed? Kind of what are the next most important areas that you see moving forward? Yeah, well, I think particularly thinking about the study of animal emotions, I mean, my guess is that the most exciting next step is going to be to find new techniques for specifically measuring animals' emotions. And as I said before, we're very good at measuring their behavior, mm -hmm. but often behavior doesn't necessarily correlate with how individuals are feeling. And I think that sort of new psychophysical techniques, again, some, like some of the ones you used in your own lab, might be useful in, in studying these kinds of questions. They might give us a unique window into actually what's going on inside the animal's head in terms of their own emotions. And so I think the most exciting thing in the next step for this field, particularly with studying emotions, is actually applying some of these new techniques um, and seeing what they can tell us about the animal mind. Excellent. So then when you have students, you know, when we think about the future, it's often the students that are at the forefront. When they come to you with an interest in these kinds of questions, or they're thinking about embarking in this field, um, they come to you for advice, what do you tell them, or what would you tell them? Well, the first thing would be to get started, right, to actually dive in and do some research yourself. Um, one of the nice things about working animal cognition is that, you know, even little kids come up with these same questions. You know, little kids want to know, what's my dog thinking? What does he know? Does he know what that word means? And so on. Um, and so my advice would be to jump in and start doing it. Um, you know, if you have access to doing work with primates, that's fantastic. But many, many research universities around the country actually have ways that you can get involved and work with dog cognition. Um, and even if you're listening to the series and you're not near there, there are cool new tools on the internet that can allow you to do some of this stuff. Um, so my colleague, uh, Brian Hare at Duke University, has just started his own website called dognition.com. Hmm. And as part of Dognition, you can get involved in citizen science and help test your own dog or test other people's dogs. Um, to look at kind of cool new questions. So even if you're far away from labs that are doing this stuff, there are ways for you to get involved. Um, but that would be my main advice is like, jump in, try to see what doing empirical science with animals is really like, and you know, see if it's for you. Great. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us today, Lori.
problem. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me as part of the series. Yeah, thank you. So this concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Lori Santos from Yale University. Thanks again.